Once upon a time, two friends joined forces to bring you the best in horror entertainment. Brian from the north, Tim from the south, each bringing their own unique perspective to the horror community. Movie reviews, Blu-ray releases, beer pairings, games, and more. Welcome to your new home for horror. This is Civil War. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the July 2022 Disc Memberment. This is the Civil War Podcast. I'm your host, Tim. And this is Brian. And we were both very tired. We had long weeks. So, But we'll try and, we'll try and keep up the, the excitement for all 9,624 titles in July. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As there, there's a lot. There's not a lot, but there was way more than we expected, I think. And there's a lot of extras this this uh, week. Yeah. I mean, this month. Yeah. It's like they decided, let's, let's put every single uh feature on every disc just yeah. so they could hear more of brian and tim's voices <laughs> I don't know. although there's some good titles this month really really yeah. good stuff some stuff that i am uh really looking forward to especially my pick of the week for the last week is my is my absolute total disc i'm looking forward to the most this month because uh it is a sequel to one of my favorite discs i bought this year uh or sets i should say so we'll uh we'll talk about that shortly i hope everybody had a great july 4th weekend Oh, that's right, because by the time you hear this, it would have passed. Yes, in in uh, the podcast you're listening to, I had a fantastic four-day weekend. As I'm recording this, I haven't had it yet, so yeah. uh, hopefully it will be fantastic. Yeah, and I have one as well, just different days. Tim's got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and I have uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So, you know. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. All right, so let's get things started. We'll kick it off with the day you're listening to this right now, July 5th, and these are your releases First up from Kino Lorber, man. Kino Lorber is knocking it out of the park this month with a trio of insect titles. So if you like movies about bugs, you're going to love Kino Lorber's set this week. The first one up is called Ants. It's from 1977. I believe all of these were TV movies, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, a lakeside resort comes under attack by an infinite horde of flesh-eating ants in this eco-horror classic. Lakeside Manor is not yet open to the public, but the resort's owner, Ethel Adams, played by Myrna Loy, has invited a select group of elite guests to the opening of her new venture, including a disreputable businessman, Gerald Gordon, and his luscious partner, Gloria Henderson, Suzanne Summers. But everyone's expectations of a peaceful and luxury-filled visit are smashed when the nearby construction site unleashes millions of deadly ants on the hotel. Infected by pesticides and highly aggressive, these ants provide a grisly end to anyone who crosses their path. The guests are scrambling to get out of the hotel, but an unlucky group end up trapped inside, moving up higher and higher in an attempt to escape the ants. But the ants are moving up too. That's a weird way to phrase it. Yeah, and this had a good soundtrack. Did you ever hear that so, uh, the the song for it though? It goes, you know, it says, it says, "Come on under our door, <laughs> crawl all over our food, <laughs> take a bite of what's his and his and her." No, I'm kidding. Um, but <laughs> you gotta love Suzanne Summers. You gotta, yeah. And and but but I I still uh, while this looks pretty good, I I. I think it's definitely better than her the other insect film she did previously, which was Bee's Company. But um, <laughs> two oh, Three's Company jokes in the same. That's great. Thing. I'm, that's, I'm all, I gotta I'm get points for that. for that, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's the extras. We have uh, includes both the uh, television one thirty three to one and the one eighty five to one theatrical versions of the film. New audio interview with production assistant and daughter of producer Alan Landsberg, Valerie Landsberg. New audio commentary by author and critic Lee Gambin. Oh, we uh, didn't we didn't mention well, him, but he's only in critic mode this time. Yeah, he's so. in critic mode. He doesn't get a mention. Yeah. Uh, new audio interview with actress Barbara Brownell. New audio interview with actor Barry Van Dyke. New audio interview with actress Anita Gillette. Uh, new audio interview with actor Moosey Dreyer. <laughs> That's a great name, Moosey Dreyer. Newly commissioned art by Vince Evans. Reversible art and limited edition O card slipcase. Is Barry Van Dyke like the uh, like the Joe Estevez of that? the van dyke family because you know this must be. and jerry who you know people know them you know of course yeah. jerry was from uh, in coach and uh you know dick van dyke from a million different shows and movies and everything but i feel like barry van dyke is like well listen we know your brothers are really successful the best i can do is offer you ants and see yes. what you do with it you know but yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if they're really connected, but I'd like to dream sometimes. I, I you know, I think I like the creative liberties we take with the disc memberment. Hey, it's our disc memberment. We can do whatever we it want is. to. With it is, and I, you know what? I, I'd love to see the world sometimes where we, if the disc memberment. I mean, the regular world's not so great these days. So maybe our yeah. disc member world is the proper one we should be in. Like, you know, how, like the metaverse. We should have like our disc memberverse or something. Yes, exactly. 
so moving on from uh, ants, let's go to a little bit uh, of a bigger creature, and this is tar- Kino Lorber's Tarantulas, the deadly cargo from 1977. Our good friend Dan, the t-shirt guy I know, will not watch this movie. He is not yes. a big fan of spiders in any way. And here is uh, here's the plot of this. It says an airplane car. Well, according to and now, I'm not making fun of Tim. This Tim just copies I just, and paste. I just copy paste. Yeah. So, an airplane carrying <laughs> or carring. Or, it's it's carring. in car mode. Yeah, they could be carring it. I'm not sure. Yeah. It must be well, on autopilot. It yeah, it must be. I mean, well, especially because obviously they don't realize all this happens on here. So, their carring coffee beans from South America has some unpleasant stowaways. A horde of tarantulas, which which and it's funny they spelled horde wrong. Uh, in the description, <laughs> but um, they, they they use it the verb horde rather than yeah. horde. H-O-R-D. They're they're really uh they're really batting on all cylinders. For yeah, us, yeah. Us lack um, of spell check here. Yeah, uh, of tarantulas which overcome the pilots as the airplane is flying over an orange producing town in California. That's an odd detail, but um, <laughs> the uh, airplane crashes and the unlucky inhabitants of the town release the poisonous spiders into their midst. Wait a minute, why did it sound like the town did it on purpose? Are tarantulas poisonous? I don't know. I don't think they are, but why do they say? But why does it sound like I said the unlucky happens? The town released the poison. What did they do? It's not like they pulled the plane down. It crashed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get this one. Uh, once the town officials discover that the tarantulas are responsible for several several deaths, the tarantulas have already descended upon the town's only orange processing factory. The town citizen risks their lives to remove the tarantulas from the factory, while the poisonous pests are rendering motionless by the transmitted sound of buzzing bees. Okay, so there's, they use bees to go after the tarantulas. And they're trying to save their orange crops. Now, I okay, I get it. You know, if you're a small town and this is your main source of income, but you're really going to risk everything, why don't you just, like, plant something else? <laughs> you know, it's like bomb this freaking orange <laughs> grove and then start planting a palm tree or something. I don't know. Um, anyway, I kind of vaguely remember this movie. It was just funny. But I don't think I saw, like, the, the, the only trailer we could find was, like, a TV ad. And I kind of remember seeing an ad similar to this. I just don't think it was... Um, I probably was like a later version of it because I was only been five when this came out. But, you know, I mean, these movies like back in the day like this, those movies would air and then air year after year. Oh, yeah. They would run all the time. You know, so I, it's not shocking that I would probably remember this from maybe a couple years after, like its second, third run of it or something. Uh, but uh, it's got a 2K restoration of the film and it's got a new audio commentary by the Made for TV Mayhem show podcast hosts. Another one we're being snubbed on. But, I mean, <laughs> if you look at it, though, it, it is... Uh, does have a, a film historian on their crew, so I guess that's why they took uh, precedent over us. And that's uh, Amanda Reyes, Dan Budnick, and Nate Johnson. Of course, Amanda Reyes, we all know her. She has all those crazy uh, facts, so that's why she's perfect for one of those made-for-TV movie things. So Yeah, and she was great on the Night Gallery. Uh, oh, right, series. yeah. And I saw her in something else. There was some other, um, I don't know if it was a Blu-ray I had or something else that she was, maybe it might have been the Eurocrypt. I don't know. There was some other kind of, uh, maybe not that one, but it was some other set I had where she appeared on it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and there was newly commissioned art by Vince Evans and limited edition O-Card slipcase. All right, so this next one, don't put it next to tarantulas on your uh, Blu-ray shelf because they might fight because apparently, I guess, tarantulas are scared of bees. So Kino Lorber is releasing Terror Out of the Sky from 1978. This is a TV sequel to The Savage Bees, which was not released this week. I don't know why. Uh, And it features more ravaging insects. This time, a marching band and a school bus get in the path of the bees. And at this point, their synopsis, they're just like, okay, enough of this already. We're just going to make it short and sweet. Can't you just see this, though, the marching band? It's like, da, 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 (laughs) Bees just come over and then start taking out the drum and the major <laughs> they're flying you know? down the tuba the guy's like mouth is filling up with bees yeah like in cartoons um, yeah you know and like there's probably like a trumpet it's like burp, 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 you know <laughs> as it goes back into his throat oh my god so many possibilities that probably never took place in this oh, movie they, well I, yeah, if you remember the if you remember brian everybody was scared of killer bees in the early 80s remember all you heard about was the I killer bees am. are coming yeah i still am or you know you see these things on the nature shows these the tarantulas that fall out of the sky and the the killer bees and what would we had the murder hornets a couple of years ago yeah yeah the murder hornets were like the new killer i was like i ain't scared of murder hornets i already lived through the killer bee scare of the early 80s so i'm, I'm fine um yeah uh this has a, a new 2k restoration of the film 
has a new audio commentary by film historian David Del Val and filmmaker David De Deca- Cato. And David Del Val, you know, is uh, he's our uh, Frankie Avalon lookalike. Used to do beach exploitation movies in the sixties. Hey, we're kind of close on him a little bit. Look <laughs> I know. Wise. I know. Oh, we actually. Well, anybody with the name Del Val, come on. Yeah, well, they he's all to. over the uh, the full moon like uh, streaming service. There's a whole like yeah. series on him that like yeah. he hosts like a show. Uh, this has newly commissioned art by Vince Evans and a limited edition O-Card slipcase. I'll make, like, make a nice little trilogy there if you're, if you're yeah. into some Kino Lorber this week. And, and you know what's funny? It's like the, if you look at the David DeCoteau, like he he barely uh, – or no, actually, we pronounce it wrong. Um, uh, oh, I'm sure we do. I, no, I pronounce we were, every name wrong. Yeah, no, but um, remember we were kind of – we were told – I uh, had a pr- someone told us how to uh, pronounce it correctly. Remember, they were pronouncing it that way, and we never uh, were like. Uh, it was Jason Paul Collum was the one that told us. I remember he mentioned him. He said David Decato or Decato. Decato. Deca- he say Decata. it. Yeah, he said it the right proper. Pro- I'm sure the proper way because he knows him. It was a much cooler way too. I yeah, think it was Decato. Yeah, Decato. But it was funny, is though, because he like the last time he appeared as a film historian, it was because he was paired with David Delval, and we said that Vinegar Syndrome just uh, called him first because his name was in the Rolodex. But this is funny. I guess Keno Lorber has the same problem because <laughs> they they paired him together too. And you know, I think here's a, an interesting thing. Like a piece I'm gonna make, you know. Like back then, I feel like not just because we were younger and impressionable children, but I feel back then we were a lot more afraid of like the simpler things because, and I think for the reason is that like now you hear something, you could look up on the internet. Now, granted, oh, yeah, sometimes yeah. it'll terrify you worse, but you could probably if you search long enough, and this is just the way the internet works with algorithm, you will start finding the articles that make you feel better. And, you know, it's very rare that if you if you look hard enough, you won't find someone that will calm you down on the Internet, whether it's like, you know, you always want to look at the source, though, of course, because you never know where it's coming from. But um, but it's kind of funny. So it's like I think there's there's that that instant able to research that we couldn't do back then. Like literally you see this on a Saturday morning, right? San, you know, sans your mom or dad taking you to the library and looking through microfiche, which you doubt you're going to interrupt your Saturday morning cartoons yeah. for. You're just going to live in fear until you, the next time you're at a library. And of but course, like, your you friends know, are all hyping it up and you have yeah, no way to debunk it. Yeah, because there's always the one friend that gets excited about it. Yeah. And there's there's the other friends that don't care. And then there's, there's always you'll always find one that's just as scared as you. So that, that was just the way the friend makeup was back then. Yeah. You know, there was always yeah. you always found that there was always that dynamic amongst your friends but yeah interesting thing to think of that'd be a great documentary like you know like there's a plenty of documentaries uh you know tackling what scares us and the fears of it but i i wonder if there was ever one that 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 touched on that subject that maybe because you know because now we have such instantaneous uh research at our fingertips that we could basically uh you know kind of like we don't have to wait until you know, it used to be like news at 11 What's lurking in the air above you? Killer yeah, bees. Yeah. And then, but now back to Dallas, you know, it's like, now you could just say, oh shit, I'm not watching. I don't care what happens to JR. I'm going to find out now. You know? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> you couldn't do that back then. You had to sit through Dallas, uh, biting off of your fingernails to find out if the killer bees were outside, you know? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, then this monstrous, this one's from screen media from 2022. The story centers on a traumatized woman fleeing from her abusive ex-husband with her seven year old son. In their new remote sanctuary, they find they have a bigger, more terrifying monster to deal with. Um, this is the one with Christina Ricci. She always uh, pretty much uh, will will uh, kind of garner a watch for me, you know, just because, you know, she's always so good. And we grew, we grew up kind of watching her, and now she's getting all these adult roles. and Yeah, horror, we kind of grew up with comedy. her, if you think about it. Yeah, we did. We kind of did. And it's and it, it those it kind of like, you know, almost like Drew Barrymore is kind of like one of those where it's like, you know, you kind of grew up with them and you see them advance their whole career. So you feel like, you know what, like I owe it to them to watch all their their uh, content. You know? <laughs> yeah, this one looked this one looked pretty good. I have heard mixed reviews of it, but I'm, I'm going to definitely give it a watch. Mm-hmm. Um, next up from IFC Films, we have. Oh, yeah. No, no uh, extras, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No extras. Uh, next up from IFC Films, we have A Banquet from 2021. Widowed mother Holly is radically tested when her teenage daughter Betsy experiences a profound enlightenment and, and insists that her body is no longer her own but in service to a higher power. 
Bound to her newfound, familiar. Yes. Uh, bound to her newfound faith, Betsy refuses to eat but loses no weight. In an agonizing dilemma torn between love and fear, Holly is forced to confront the boundaries of her own beliefs. And let me tell you, a kid that won't eat is something I live every single day. Joshua does not eat. He will not eat. He just stays. I don't know how he lives. I really don't know how he lives. He just doesn't eat. And when any parent who's had kids will have gone through this at some point where the, the child just simply will not eat and you don't yeah. know how they're living or surviving. See, I was never like that. Like, I couldn't get enough. Like, I would just, like, I just want to always eat. Like, I was always snacking. I was always eating dinner. I was always looking, you know, I don't know. Maybe I just got fed meals I liked all the time. But, um, but yeah, I, I, but I think uh, as for uh, Joshua, I think he just, he usually probably gets like some uh orders in during his uh board meetings in the jacuzzi apparently yeah you yeah. know he must he might his secretary probably orders his business in. lunches are probably ruining his appetite i guess it is probably yeah because he probably you know his clients are pretty um <laughs> very, very vast and they, they have big appetites for uh not just business but for food so they probably order in a whole bunch of sushi you know, you know. <laughs> uh but, uh, no, yeah no extras on this one and uh yeah. Oh, yeah. Brian did mention this might set the record for most peas in a single trailer. Seriously, every pl- maybe that's why. Maybe the, I mean, Julie doesn't like peas. Maybe the daughter just does not like peas. Stop feeding her peas. Oh, I don't like peas either because I had a bad incident with peas where um, my mom like pulled one of those things where like you can't leave the table until um, you eat your peas, and then I refused to leave the table for like an hour. So I've never eaten peas since. Oh, uh, see, I you know I was always big, a big fan of peas. I love peas. I love pea soup. I love pea everything. So it's, you know anything like that's made from peas, I like. But it's funny a lot. There's a lot of people that just don't like it. And it's interesting. We were at a restaurant the other day, and so apparently, I guess I don't know if it's it's in the dr, but that they can cons- they call. Um, peas beans so you have to be careful depending on menus of, of different restaurants that they might say like because we saw something that said like something verde it was like pinto verde or something or, or some kind of thing like that and um she was like what that doesn't make sense like what is it you know is it, you know or whatever it was with you know because verde is usually that green sauce and, yeah and the guy said he explained that the waiter says well it's technically peas and she was like oh okay Ooh, and I'm like, yep yeah. i said she will not order that then <laughs> well, what's Brady. weird is I like literally every other kind of bean, and, and like black eyed peas, lima beans, butter beans, uh, like pinto beans, beans, navy <laughs> beans, fava, yeah, fava, any any kind of bean, white bean, red bean. I'll eat mm. any kind of bean, or except for green peas. Green peas. What about Mr. I bean? <laughs> well, I love Mr. Bean. I would never eat him. Yeah, he's no, awesome. he's cool. <laughs> but, but, yeah, they, no, be, yeah, peas are an odd thing, and like you know, it's like they—they they were one of those things. Like, why was that always the freaking vegetable that came with the TV dinners? Because you know, every time you open a TV dinner, like you know, there was that you know the plastic never ripped properly, and you can thank stupid Tucker Carlson, who I hate anyway. <laughs> but if you go back to Swanson's family, is, is the air you know that that family, yeah. they, they did we do this. And they'd always put peas in it. So it was inevitable that this pea would roll out and stop giving ball-shaped items because then they roll all over the kitchen. And the you, you usually grab one, but one always, like, is faster than the other and, like, shoots out right under the oven. So you know it's been there, like, for, like, generations of whatever household you live in. There's that pea somewhere wedged under the oven. Well, it was also the go-to vegetable for school lunch, and I hated school lunch, so that's another uh, reason I think I hated peas, because I was like, they always had peas and carrots, peas and carrots, and I hate, I still to this day don't really like cooked carrots. It yeah, goes back to school lunch. Why did peas and carrots go together, too? That's another one. Like, how, how did those two, like, like bond? Because know? they deserve each other in the, in the trash can. That's yeah, why. you're not a carrot fan, either? Not a cooked carrot. I, I love raw carrots, but cooked carrots, they can go with the, with the green peas yeah, in the trash. Yeah, it's funny. Julie's like that, too. Boy, you guys could have a nice meal together for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you guys would be great. You guys share. You guys could share the the meals because, like, I always want kind of want like things that uh, sometimes Julie doesn't want on there. So that's good. Uh, <laughs> this dismemberment is, is definitely one for the books. Um, okay, yeah, and I guess no extras on that. Um, except you get a bag of peas, I think. With you know. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, next one's our pick of the week. So we're skipping a little. And this one uh, from Full Moon Features. This is one that's in the, on a, the streaming service. I have in my watch list. I gotta watch. Uh, and that's Baby Oopsie from 2021. So Sybil Pittman is a meek and mild mannered doll collector whose only joy in life is restoring old dolls. Harassed by local kids, coworkers, and abusive stepmother, Sybil finds her demoralizing life take a murderous turn with the arrival of mysterious 
mysterious baby oopsie doll. What's her like? Her show is funny. It's like doll, doll something, but she has that accent, so she's like doll. Oh, something. let me tell you. So my mom used to collect dolls. She still has a ton of dolls. She used to collect dolls uh, when I was younger, and we used to go to doll shows. I mean, I'd follow her around to doll conventions and stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. this is how serious she was. Let me tell you, the lady, the Sybil Pittman in this, the, her, the way they've got her, like, stereotyped is, like, spot on. <laughs> spot really? on to most of those old, like, I don't want to say old middle-aged doll collectors exactly i mean i was i was laughing so hard because it just like i was having like ptsd flashbacks to my doll convention days oh uh, my God. going through there but yeah it was pretty funny i can't wait to watch this one i'm so yeah, excited no, for this one yeah this one looks great i mean of course people are going to compare it a little bit to like to like child's play or chucky but you know what it's got it this definitely this series stands on its own i think this is a whole like right there's a couple of them i think yeah Isn't i there- wasn't there wasn't there like a doll in the um demonic toys was this the same baby oh yeah i think that yeah it's maybe that's what it is it's from another one of their their yeah. series um but uh yeah so it's there's got a baby oopsie video zone featurette a behind the scenes all dolled up featurette that was what it was she remember she goes all welcome yeah. to all dolled up yes <laughs> like yeah like it's like it, i could just see tim being a guest now like Oh Tim, yeah, tell oh, us I the could, date. <laughs> I could tell you a lot more about there. doll conventions than you've ever wanted to know. Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> oh, and also full moon feature trailers, which probably is one of a great is really a great special feature because full moon trailers are pretty fun to watch. Doll so collecting like is this. how doll collecting is how my mom met Richard Simmons. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, she met Richard Simmons. He was at a doll convention. Was he promoting his like his? I think so. I think he was. Remember, he had Richard one Simmons back style. when. Yeah, there was a there was a Richard Simmons. Uh, there was and, like um, two of them. I think there was one like somewhat recent, like a, a like didn't they make like a Mego make um or Mego make a like a new version of it, like yeah, recently? Because I think I remember for some reason I remember like Cone like sending us a picture from Target or something, <laughs> but um, but I think they 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 had one back when he back in the seventies too when he was big. Oh yeah, yeah, and then eighties. Um, sorry. Do you remember um, the clown Emmett Kelly? Oh my be... God! Yeah, yeah. We I had a, a creepy picture of my 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 uh, parents' house still. Yeah, I met the real Emmett Kelly at really? a doll, at a doll store. Yeah, he was there, and he was in full makeup. He he was there in full makeup uh, doing his Emmett Kelly dolls. There was, was like pretty... a whole new part of your life. I'm just I know. Today, <laughs> this is everybody. You, know, you think you know somebody? I've now I've known Tim for seven years already and yet i've never heard this this doll backstory to him in there, but, uh, some things you have to keep secret until the yeah. time is right the time, yeah. the, the <laughs> well, time was I, right this was a perfect reveal tim I yes have to uh, say. You, you're you, you've always been a showman in that capacity you've come up with good good reveals i waited 230 some episodes to, yeah. to reveal that I just had to, had to get the right doll movie in there. I mean, here. and think about it. We went through the entire, like, Chucky thing. We went to Kathy's oh, yeah, that Curse. Kept it close to the vest. Like, yeah. right? Was Kathy's Curse had that doll in it? Or was that the other one? Oh, uh, I think it was another one, yeah. Uh, but it was like that. Yeah, it was yeah. like that kind of a movie. Yeah, see? And look at that. You you waited until Baby Oopsie. And you people that don't listen to the dismemberments, that's where you miss out on the good stuff. You right? do. You, this is where you find out about, like... Tim's aversion to peace, Tim's doll culture, you know, all of this stuff. Because the dismemberment's where we can be a little, we can let our hair down, so to speak. We're a little, a little more casual. Yeah, it's kind of like doing an off-topic episode, but not really ever being off-topic per se, because it's always connected somehow remotely to a horror movie. Well, because every title is a tangent, so that's why it it's, is. it's fun. Okay, so speaking of tangents, let's go to our pick of the week, and this is uh, this one is a fun tangent to uh, Evil Dead. Because this is the uh, essentially the Japanese version of Evil Dead. It's from Wild Eye Releasing. It's called Bloody Muscle Bodybuilder in Hell. It's from 2009. And the summary here is, After a surprise phone call interrupts his daily workout, beefy bodybuilder Naoto agrees to meet his photojournalist ex-girlfriend to help with her research on haunted houses. Accompanied by a professional psychic, they visit an abandoned house once owned by Naoto's father. But inside the house, a dark secret lingers, and they find themselves trapped and tormented by a relentless ghost with a 30-year grudge. See what they did there, grudge? I know. Um, but yeah, this one is our pick of the week because it just looks so much fun, so insane, crazy gore. It looks very Evil Dead-ish. And uh, yeah, I, I'm totally down for it. Um, this one has a ton of good extras here. It's got an archival 1995 SD master from the original tapes, remastered in 1080p. New interview with director Shinichi Fukuzawa. 
Commentary track featuring directors Adam Green, Hatchet and Frozen, and Joe Lynch, Shutter's Creep Show and Mayhem. That's I, I mean, can't... think of that alone already because yeah. I'm sure they got a lot of inspiration from this type of movie, especially um, Mayhem. Yeah. Uh, you know, with if you if you you've seen that one, right? Um, I think Joe Bob yeah. showed it one night. Uh, yes, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like you could tell, Joe Lynch definitely probably got something from this based off this trailer, what we saw and what I saw from Mayhem. So uh, we also have a new film historian commentary track with Japanese film historian James Harper. Yeah, I, I mean, hearing the name, not to sound like uh, like offensive, but like James Harper doesn't really sound like a guy that would be like kind of really into to to Japanese film, but I wouldn't know. But um, anyway, so but the thing is, he never intended to be the Japanese film historian. What happened is in film historian school, um, you know, when he he didn't get to pick first. So Italian and uh, French were already taken, which were his two French choices. So and also Amanda Ray is picked right before him and took the coveted TV, TV movie historian slot due to its ease. So good old James Harper got Japanese film historian. But I have to say, I don't know why he didn't want this i would have picked this like at the top of my list yeah because especially these days oh my god i found between japanese horror and korean horror have been so like every movie i've seen has been like amazing so now this is kind of interesting james harper's story kind of reminds me of my story when i was in high school i wanted to take latin because i planned to go to medical school so i was going to take latin as my foreign language and I literally went in to talk to the Latin teacher because this is when you could talk. It's like a preview night where you could go talk to the teachers first. I remember those. Yeah, they don't yeah. do those anymore, do they? I don't think so. So I went in to talk to the Latin teacher and was sitting there talking. Well, the German class was right beside the Latin class. Mm. And the German teacher came out and he was like, he's like, are you, are you interested in German? And I said, no, 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 I'm taking Latin. He's like, why are you taking Latin? That's a dead language. Like, come take German. That's more fun. And, you know, it's, you know, it'd be something you could actually use. And you know, we're going to go to Germany, and I mean, he, like he really sold it. Uh, I'll never. Ken remembers as Mister Tetterton. He was a character. In, uh, I was going to say he didn't like threaten you. No, no, but, no, but he was. <laughs> but you know, and he sold me on it. Like he literally sold me on it right there. So I ended up taking German instead, and that's where I met Ken. I know. Think of that. Think of like your life path. Like with, it's like Sans Ken. You know. Yeah, just that one little. So weird. I mean, what met one of my best friends of my entire life because of that one conversation. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, the same the same thing with uh, it's funny because like it was my best friend Mark, right? So we um, when I moved in to, from my mom to my dad, I you know I, I hit fourth grade. I had I went to Hebrew school, and so um, the, at that point in our area, there were two um, two schools in our area, um, elementary schools, and where based on where you lived is the one you went to, and so. I went to one and Mark was at the other, but we met in Hebrew school and we were like, we started off as like mortal enemies and like, we would like torture each other in Hebrew school. Then when we, my dad decided to, he bought a house into the other and we moved in the other neighborhood. Well, then, then I got, then I was also in Mark, not only Mark's elementary school, but without him, without knowing like the feud that Mark and I had, I got put into Mark's carpool for Hebrew school. (laughs) <laughs> and but then we we both uh, one day both got in trouble uh probably for arguing about something and then we bonded and have been like you know essentially he's like another brother of mine so it's kind of funny how you never know like one little change like that could yeah could determine could spawn, the course of your like, life everything yeah it's crazy and i mean through mark i met cone i mean you know it's like all these things so. it's crazy all right some more uh, extras here we have a special effects video behind the scenes image gallery archival image gallery outtakes Hold a collectible mini poster, original archival trailers from the Japanese release. Four page liner notes by Matt Des- Desiderio of Horror Boobs. <laughs> okay, okay, Horror Boobs. What is that? I don't know, but I kind of kind of interested I now. Like, read the liner notes to this. I hope it's from a broader like book or something. Yeah, <laughs> uh, vintage style laminated video store rental card. That's cool. Uh, visual vengeance trailers. Stick your own video store rental sticker sheet and a reversible sleeve featuring original Japanese home video art. So not only is it a crazy movie, you get some kind of cool extras here, like the rental card and the sticker sheet. Oh, that's kind of neat. I like that. Uh, so this is a recap. Our week of July fifth, we had ants from nineteen seventy seven, tarantulas from the, tarantulas the deadly cargo, I should say, from nineteen seventy seven, terror out of the sky from nineteen seventy eight, which is bees if you can't stand ants or tarantulas. Monstrous from 2022, which is a Christina Ricci vehicle. A Banquet from 2021. 
Uh, Baby Oopsie from 2021. That's also a full moon feature. And our pick of the week, Wild Eye releasing Bloody Muscle Bodybuilder in Hell, billed as the Japanese Evil Dead 2009. Yes. All right. July 12th is a very short week. Only two releases this week. Uh, kind of weird how sometimes they stack them all in one week and they yeah. short short change the other ones. There is an Angel Heart 4K Steelbook coming out. But I believe that's just a reissue in the Steelbook form. So our first release here is RLJ Entertainment's The Twin from 2022. Following the aftermath of a tragic accident that claimed the life of one of their twins, Rachel and Anthony relocate to the other side of the world with their surviving son. What begins as a time of healing in the quiet Scandinavian countryside soon takes an ominous turn when Rachel begins to unravel the torturous truth about her son and confronts the malicious forces that are trying to take hold of him. Does anything good happen on the Scandinavian countryside? I swear. No, well, especially Never heard not about, like, a pleasant thing that happens yeah. there. I'll say this one looks pretty creepy. I mean, it, the the plot looks kind of something like we've probably seen before, but I will say it looks creepy enough that I would give it a shot. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely, yeah, it looks, it's definitely decent, I mean, it's, you know, it's RLJ, so it's, it's probably Shutter, on Shutter, so you know it's gonna be, um, they don't just, you know, they don't, they tend to not miss very often, right, uh, with, uh, with the release there, um, so funny that every time I hear Twin, I always think of Overboard, with Goldie Hawn, remember? Twin! Oh, Twin! <laughs> I just can't remember the name, but, uh, anyway, sorry, um, that's just my bizarro, uh, <laughs> uh quote. No extras on this one, so I will turn it over to Brian for our only remaining title in our pick of the week. Yes. So, I mean, now obviously, th- this one might have still won on, like, a, a busier week. But, I mean, this in a week of two, this is definitely going to win. Uh, this one is from Code Red, and it's Terror Circus from 1974. It says, three showgirls on their way to Las Vegas have car trouble and are stuck all night out in the desert. The next morning, cheerful Andre offers to help them. I don't know why. I wonder if that's his nickname, Cheerful Andre. I know, Cheerful Andre. (laughs) Offers to help them in fixing their car. However, Andre is really a maniac with with a lot of family problems. His mother ran out on him. (laughs) Most maniacs do have a lot of family problems. Yeah, it's really rare you'll find a well-adjusted family uh, (laughs) behind a a maniac, but... uh, my, myself not included no, because I, I have a wonderful family yet I, I've been called a maniac before uh, not in like a murderous way just like a weirdo way but um, anyway uh, back to the, the description here it says um, I, anyway he I had a lot of family problems his mother ran out on him when he was a child so now he keeps kidnapped women chained up in his barn and trains up to perform circus tricks that's, that's <laughs> definitely the response you would expect I mean right I mean come on oh, that I mean he me is and, but he does it cheerfully apparently so, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, of course, you know, your mother runs out on you. You just had to chain other people up. Hey, for, he's just trying and... to bring some entertainment to the town. Yeah. What's wrong with well, that? I still don't know where the circus part comes in. I'm sure that's revealed in the movie. Um, yeah. Andre's father is still around, of course. Why, of course? Why yeah. is that like, why would that be, of course? Uh, but because the old homestead is next to a nuclear test site, he's been transformed into, a, and transformed into a raving homicidal mutant that Andre keeps locked up in a shed. Yeah, I, I describe this as Barnum Bailey presents The Hills Have Eyes. Yeah, I mean, this it's like thing a is Cirque like du Soleil themed of <laughs> Hills Have Eyes or, like, or something. As Burt Wonderstone said, Cirque du Soleil. But uh, yeah, no, hopefully it's, it's not like that. I, I'm hope it kind of reminds me a little bit of Blood Harvest, a little bit of like, The Fun House. You know, there's yeah. a lot of movies that this kind of like feels like it ha- it could be like like mixed together in that kind of genre, but um, yeah. but yeah, so it um it's got a it's got a couple of features. It's got a previously remastered from the original camera negative, Born Again, returning to Terror Circus, interviews with associate producer Marvin Almias, costume designer Alan A. Apone, actress Jennifer Ashley, and special makeups effects creators Bird Holland and Douglas J. White. Limited edition O card slipcase. You know, there must be somewhere some O card slipcase factory somewhere because all these Slip, Blu rays are yeah. using them. Yeah, everybody. Um, and you, you hear there's people that trade in slipcases. And you go on the really? like, the, yeah, I've, I'm on some horror Facebook groups and you'll have people like selling just the slipcase for some of the Shout Factory discs for people that didn't get it. You know, because sometimes you'll order one that usually comes with a slipcase and maybe it doesn't come with one. I mean, sometimes there's a kind of a crapshoot of whether you get one or not, depending That's interesting. on the I wonder if there's like a bootleg like slipcase yeah. <laughs> ring going on. I, well, I used to make my own. Uh, well, I, I, should I say this? I guess I'll say it. I guess I, I guess the statute of limitations has run out. But when a buddy of mine at work used to rip DVDs for me, 
like because he would like pirate them. Or you didn't remember when you could like rent from Blockbuster and like you like copy them on your oh, computer. Oh yeah, that's rip my, them. my grandfather did that like his whole life. Yeah, like rip them. So I would make my own DVD covers. Like I'd buy empty cases and I'd make my own DVD yeah. covers and print them off and put it in so it looked legit. So yeah. Um, so yeah, the recap July twelfth, just as two releases, the Twin from twenty twenty two and Terror Circus from nineteen seventy four. Go, go watch that trailer for Terror Circus. It's it's kind of ridiculous. There's a weird song playing throughout the whole yeah. thing where people are obviously talking, but yet they don't let you hear any dialogue. They just keep playing the music. Yeah, like they they stripped all the dialogue and just played this weird song every. All right, so that brings us to the week of July nineteenth, and our first release here is our pick of the week. So we're not going to do that one. Move right on to Arrows the Righteous from last year. A burdened man feels the wrath of a vengeful god after he and his wife are visited by a mysterious stranger. And uh, this one was in, it looks like it's entirely in black and white. Uh, I didn't really get a lot of, uh, didn't get much thrill out of this trailer. It just seemed like a generic kind of, um, I want to say demonic possession, but sort of religious overtone type movie. And I, I don't know if I really cared for the trailer. Yeah, it wasn't really anything special. Uh, extra does have some good extras here though. Brand new audio commentary by writer, director, and actor Mark O'Brien and editor Spencer Jones. Cast and crew interviews with writer, director, actor Mark O'Brien, producer Mark O'Neill, actors Henry Zerny, Mimi Kuzik, and Kate Corbett, editor Spencer Jones, cinematographer Scott McClellan, and round table discussion with Mark O'Brien and Matt Bettinelli Open, Tyler Gillette or Gillett, and Chad Villella of Radio Silent Stage Presentation and QA with Mark O'Brien and Henry Zerny from the World Premiere at Fantasia International Film Festival 2021. Uh, Grimfest 2021 live stream Q&A with Mark O'Brien, original soundtrack, image gallery accompanied by the film's original score by Andrew Stanlon, reversible sleeve featuring newly commissioned artwork by Grant Boland, and Oink Creative, <laughs> first pressing only, fully illustrated collector's booklet featuring new writing on the film by Sean Hogan. Did we, did we ever have him as a film historian? I don't know why. It just sounds familiar, because I remember doing doing a Hulk Hogan impersonation once during the dismemberment. But it's possible, but if he's not, if he doesn't show no, up for work. he's not listed yeah, there. If, he, if yeah. he doesn't show up as a film historian, he doesn't get the, uh, he doesn't get the shout out. That's no, he does not. Sorry, Sean Hogan. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so the next one is uh, Blue Underground, and it's God Told Me To 4K. Uh, 4K is the disc thing, not that God told me to 4K. Anything like that. Uh 1976, it says, A New York detective investigates a series of murders committed by random New Yorkers who claim that God told them to. Um, yeah, this one, uh, like Tim said, too, I've always wanted to see this one. Um, you hear it mentioned one I, a like, lot. I always hear it yeah. mentioned. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, but haven't seen it. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's, uh, the, it's got a brand new K4 restor- uh, K restoration of the film from the original uncensored camera, camera negative. It's got new audio commentary with film historians Steve Mitchell and Troy Howarth. And Steve Mitchell, he's, uh, I don't know if you remember him, Tim, but he's Howard Berger's friend, uh, another film historian from high school. And he got picked on, and Howard stood up for him. Uh, like, kind of like, think like Burt Wonderstone uh, and how he, it was Burt and Anton, which is the second Burt Wonderstone reference to this, uh, <laughs> this dismemberment. I, it was not intentional. But uh, eventually, Howard, of course, he got too big for, big for his britches. But after a few years, realized he was wrong and made amends and reunited with Steve, and they became film historians. But he, specifically Steve, is like that down-to-earth everyman. You know, he'd give you the shirt off his back unless it's a super limited edition audio, auto, audio, I, that doesn't mean to say audiographed. It should be autographed by Darren McGavin, Colcheck the Night Stalker t-shirt. <laughs> and right. Troy Howarth, of course, was the posh English man. He's nothing else uh, because he's no. not teamed with Nathaniel Thompson. Or Bruce Holchek, and he's not a Stygian witch in this either. So. <laughs> and people who are new to the Dismemberment have zero clue what we're talking about. No, yeah, you, you gotta yeah. have At to this go. Point, if we're getting new listeners, I, if yeah. got, then you know what? Hopefully, they'll go back anyway. But, these these inside jokes go way back, fellas. All right. But it's so funny. Every time I mention Stygian witches, it gets you every time. Yeah, it makes me laugh every time. I don't know why they're so funny, but they're, they're supposed to be scary. But I know. I think the word Stygian just cracks me up. It is, and it's your. I'm telling you, it's your brother's fault. Yes, one hundred percent your brother's fault yeah. for mentioning it on his podcast. Um, anyway, it's got some good other good uh, things. It's got an audio commentary with writer, producer, director Larry Cohen, which is going to be good. Uh, heaven on Heaven and Hell on Earth interview with star Tony Lobianco. Bloody Good Times an interview with special effects artist Steve Neal. Go, <laughs> God, why'd you laugh at that? Because I, I meant me. No, I'm laughing at the out. one you're about to read. Oh, God told me to bone. <laughs> <laughs> New Beverly Q&A with Larry Cohen. Um, 
It's like it's like kind of like the uh, knocked up memories. Like you know how they say, "Don't drink and drive." I don't drink and moan. <laughs> As uh, that was my terrible Seth Rogen impersonation, but uh, <laughs> it was just on the other day. That was so pretty fresh good. In my head. Yeah, it was better than I usually do with yeah. him. But uh, yeah, uh, Lincoln Center Q and A with Larry Cohen, theatrical trailers, TV spots, poster, and still gallery, and first pressing only. Tim limited edition embossed slip cover featuring new artwork and reversible sleeve with classic artwork soon to be in Tim's Facebook group. <laughs> That's <for> right. Sale. <laughs> All right. Next up is a. This one looks crazy. All right. This is the. From VCI, the Aztec Mummy Collection, 1957 and 1964. This has three films in it. First up is Curse of the Aztec Mummy. It features the walking dead Popoca. Throw in some mobsters led by a tough guy called the Bat and his enemy, a masked superhero wrestler called the Angel. The most rarely seen of the Popoca series, this Mayan mummy moving is dizzling... Movie, I guess. is dizzyingly familiar. Uh, the second film is The Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy. Out to find the ancient Aztec treasure, a mad scientist referred to as the Bat builds a giant humanoid robot to conquer the mummy warrior who is guarding the treasure's map of the tomb where the treasure is located. This is the K. Gordon Murray version. Uh, okay. And then the next one is Wrestling Women versus the Aztec Mummy. The Wrestling Women were two beautiful female Mexican luchadoras who starred in a series of five wrestling horror movies made in the 60s. Their two most famous films were Doctor of Doom from 1960 and this one, in which they go up against Popoca, the Aztec mummy. It sounds like such a friendly name for a mummy. I know. I, it doesn't. He does, he sounds like one that would like, like almost like have the instead of a monster, be like Frankenstein, kind of just mis Doctor yeah, Frankenstein's monster, just kind of misunderstood. Yeah, the mummy was originally introduced in a series of three Mexican horror films, all released in '57, and was a true fan favorite with Mexican monster movie buffs. Now you can witness his titanic encounter with the voluptuous wrestling women. So yes, I mean, they did not give them by name though. So we have no idea who they are. Anything with luchadors fighting mummies, so I'm in. Oh, yeah. Robots versus wrestlers. Yeah, anything wrestlers pretty much are going to be for a fun time. Popoka sounds sort of like it should be one of the monster cereals. <laughs> it does. Like, it has, like, Frankenberry, cow chocolate, Popoka. Popoka. <laughs> yeah, and you have to say it that way. I think with yeah. that little, it's kind of like with Parker Posey. You know, you got to go, Popoka. <laughs> Uh, this one has we have another great new film historian here well film, I should say film authority which I I thought film authority might might like that might be even a step above a film historian yeah like I don't know is that like the uh, like yeah is that like the, the teacher of the film historian school I don't yeah. know but either way we, we included him because yeah. until we get a full thing but um, uh, so it's Dr. David Wilt uh, he picked after James Harper actually yeah <laughs> In his film historian school. So maybe he's not uh, the teacher. He might be just another student. But, uh, and uh, he also, interesting. So Dr. Wilt is unusual link to another famous Wilt, although Ooh. he was denied sex from over 100,000 women. <laughs> so it's kind of the, ver- reverse, <laughs> the reverse. The reverse. But, uh, I yeah. got it. but I, I heard some, uh, like, I, I read something in the Elvira book that, like, totally, like, not that I was a super a huge fan of, of Wilt Chamberlain because he seemed like too much of a womanizer anyway. I mean, not counting his basketball thing. I'm separating the man from his, his sport right now. I mean, of course, he was a legend in basketball. But, um, but like, I heard something in the Elvira book, which I, I won't mention, uh, sort of people that haven't read it yet that got to it that, like, just, I can't even, like, it's... He kind of disgusts me now, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I, I know it's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I did finish the Elvira book. Oh, okay, yeah, which is fantastic, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was good. Absolutely, one of the best books I've, I've a biography I've ever read. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so but um, as far as the film historians go, we we can uh, we're, we're joke about it, but as as a personal thing, I am not a fan of Wilt Chamberlain. So, all right, so Brian, this next one you're getting ready to do has probably the mo- most extras for the least deserving movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this this one is from Wild Eye Releasing, and this is The Necrophiles uh, from 1977. Uh, a cannibal rapist rises from the grave as a flesh-eating zombie sex maniac. Two Seattle cops, a satanic cult, and a flying demon fetus. Oh, wait, fly, sorry, a flying demon fetus try to stop the lust-crazed ghoul before he can kill again. But wait, the flying demon fetus, the uh, flying demon fetus wasn't, I thought that, I didn't realize that that was, it was supposed to be a real baby. 
because it's a, so apparently a doll. Does I thought it was just a flying doll the whole time. It's a ba- It's literally a baby doll on a string. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it, it is horrendous though. But I mean, at first we got neck fetuses. Now we got flying demon fetuses. <laughs> that, oh, that's it, tell me that's not f- full moon material. Uh, neck fetus versus flying ba- flying demon fetus. Yes. Well, if not, we should, we should we should make that. Yeah, I know. Let's let's talk to uh, Charles Band and see if we can. Uh, <laughs> get him to 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 green light that um but yeah it looks horrible uh, i don't even know what's going on with it other than the flying baby on the string um so it's got but yeah like tim said it's got a ton of special features that probably are not worth for for this title uh but uh archival 1997 sd master from original tapes remastered in 1080p brand new audio commentary with producer director matt jasel uh audio commentary with matt desiderio of horror boobs <laughs> there's horror <laughs> boobs again I got. We gotta Google Harb. Well, yeah. actually, if I Google Harb boobs, I already know what's gonna come up. Probably. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, pretty much every boob that was ever in a horror movie. But I gotta look up this guy specifically. Um, and Billy Burgess of the Druid Underground Film Festival. Brand new video chat with director Matt Jasel. Matt Jasel, super short, super eight short films, Chilean talk show segment. <laughs> Boy, he got around. Uh, Dong of the Dead, the making of the Necrophiles documentary. Uh, well, remind me to tell you I know it's going to sound off topic especially the people there but remind me uh, later on because I don't want to subject the poor audience to this uh, until he's not on to defend to, to kind of cover, not really defend himself but to corroborate the whole thing but uh, remind me to tell you about Cone's Dingling okay. uh, anyway <laughs> nice okay <And> moving right <laughs> I'll along leave it at that uh, the Necrophiles origin trailer The Corpse the super, a super 8 short film bonus movie Necrophiles 3000 it's a 2017 sequel just what we need. Uh, Necrophiles 3000 trailer. Visual Vengeance trailer. Retro VHS sticker set. The Necrophiles official condom. Wow. <laughs> nice. I have to say, I think that is the first time you get yeah. a condom in a, in a uh, disc memberment disc. Yeah. Uh, reversible sleeve uh, featuring original VHS art and a collectible mini poster. And, of course, every time I see condom, I want to go, like, it's condom. <laughs> like Kramer did on the time <laughs> when he found I, it. Miscarried. I think that might be a miss a typo where it's a 1977. I believe this was 1997. So um, yeah, it looked yeah. more like a 1970, uh, yeah. 1997. Yeah, so I think that was. I think it should have been 1997. Piece of crap. I don't think it's gonna matter. Uh, I don't think you want to buy this one. Um, yeah. Next up uh, from Troma is Zombie Island Massacre from 1984. And in case you forget the title of the movie when you're watching the trailer, you don't have to worry. Yeah, I should have said Zombie, 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 zombie Island, Island, Island Massacre mass, 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 mass. with Echo. Uh, Americans on vacation in the Caribbean take a tour of a nearby island at night and watch a local voodoo ritual. Soon after, they find themselves stranded on the island and under attack by unseen foes. One by one, they meet violent ends. And uh, yeah, the best thing about this trailer is how the narrator says Zombie, zombie, zombie Island, Island Massacre. Mass, mass, mass. And the, he yeah. says it like... So even he he like he says it that way even like when he's mid sentence like everyone caught yeah. in the zombie, zombie, zombie island, 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 island is running for their yeah. lives. <laughs> yeah, and it cracks me up because he's like he's like saying it almost like a vacation video, like he wants you to come there to get killed because like come to zombie, zombie island, island, island massacre island. for the cocktail party. <laughs> zombie island, 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 island massacre two. Enjoy all the the boating you can yes. do. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so weird. I swear, and if you totally, if you literally just replaced all the 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 gore and carnage uh, descriptors and put food in it, you would literally would be a, a circa nineteen seventies restaurant ad. Like you know, like come on to Friendlies. You know, have a burger. <laughs> have, have friendly. friendly. <laughs> have a burger. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, I forgot but, to mention, yeah. there's a reissue of Prom Night 1998 this week. Uh, not that anybody cares, so that's probably why. I that's Brittany her. Snow. That's probably why it came. Yeah. They re-released it. She's because uh, uh, she's pretty big now, of course, with X. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, that brings. Uh, let's see who was who did that one. Let's see that was, I did that one. So Brian, yes. you're going to do our pick of the week. Ah, uh, this is from Arrow, and you could, by the way, you can see this on the Arrow streaming service. Should you uh, want to get a preview? Uh, it's from, it's Hell High from 1989. It says, a teacher is still haunted by the death of two teens that she accidentally caused as a young girl goes berserk when four teens start harassing her and then attack her in her home. Uh, yeah, so Tim says it kind of looks like teacher revenge, definitely kind of thing. It's funny, it looks like kind of an 80s film, but it's like very late 80s, like pretty much almost into the 90s. Mm. Uh, but it does have Butox in the trailer, as Joe Bob would say. Um, it's got a ton of special features. And speaking of Joe Bob, you'll see why I even mentioned that. Um, 
Uh, brand new 2K restoration from the original camera negative, approved by cinematographer Steven Fireberg. Um, that's a, that sounds like a cool name, doesn't it? It's also the opposite of an iceberg. It is, yes. Fireberg. It's like they, they actually were, like, if he was a film historian, I totally would have come up with the backstory that they were competing things and they had songs like, I'm Mr. Heat Miser. Remember that? Like, like Heat Miser and <laughs> yes, Miser. Totally bro. be that. Yeah, That's what they'd so. be. They, they'd be Rankin Bass animated characters. <laughs> um, uh, they got a brand new audio commentary with director, producer, co writer Douglas Grossman and cinematographer Stephen Fireberg. I don't know why I said it like Vince McMahon. But, and he probably pronounces it Fearberg, and we're just oh yeah, I'm sure it's like, it's like a Fearberg. But um, uh, then it's a, then it becomes a John Houseman name, you know, from <laughs> Fireberg goes like Vince McMahon, but then it's Fearberg. <laughs> it's like John Houseman, so it depends on how he says it. Uh, it's got archival audio commentary with director, producer, co-writer Douglas Grossman, and here's that here's why he comes back. Uh, archival introduction and audio commentary with film critic. I mean, that's just a very light descripting of this man, but Joe Bob Briggs, he should have film critic, film historian, film legend. I wonder why he doesn't do more commentaries. I I would think he'd be on every commentary track. (laughs) Yeah. He, and I know we've praised Joe Bob many a times, and we've met him in person now a a number of times, and let me tell you, there's, there's not a better ambassador for the world of film and horror film, but he's like a, a vast knowledge of everything. And I'll tell you, like if you get, I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. If that redneck saved Hollywood comes touring through your town, you must go because it is like two and a half hours of pure boat. Joe Bob historical facts and, and his, and his humor. And just, it's just, it, it's like, it is such a fun thing. And, you know, Darcy's along for the ride always. And, you know, she's, she knows, uh, like, she is actually, you know, a lot of people think that she's just like this, like, pretty sidekick that he has. But she is actually a wealth of knowledge herself, especially of 80s horror films. She knows a ton. So, but yeah, don't, definitely check them out if they come by. Uh, School's Out, a newly filmed interview with director, producer, co-writer, Douglas Grossman. Uh, really, already, this is enough with his his accolade just say douglas grossman already <laughs> um a beautiful nightmare a newly filmed interview with cinematographer steven fireberg or steven Fibberg. <laughs> i'm gonna Take say his name pick. both ways yeah uh john john's journey a newly filmed interview with actor christopher cousins the more the better a newly filmed interview with actress maureen mooney music is not sound a newly filmed interview with composers rich mccarr and christopher hyams hart Back to School, The Locations of Hell High, a tour of the original Hell High filming sites with author-filmmaker Michael Gingold. Oh, but he's not a film historian here. Nope, that's author, right. author-filmmaker. He, he got demoted. Michael, what happened? Is no more Gil- Gingold and Oldies? <laughs> not, not, not this week. <sighs> not this month. Uh, it's got archival, oh God, archival uh, video interviews with, with, you know, what he did. Uh, Douglas Grossman and co-writer Leo Evans. Deleted scene, alternate opening titles, trailers and TV spots, reversible sleeve featuring original and newly commissioned artwork by Ralph Krauss, and first pressing only illustrated collector's booklet featuring linear notes by Michael Gingold. Now he's just a linear, linear note writer, <laughs> uh, including extensive, ex- oh, sorry, exclusive interview with stunt coordinator actor Webster Winery. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not winery like 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 you know, Paul Masson right. Vineyards. Yeah. It's Webs, it's winery, winery. Like that. Like, winery. Yeah, I should have said it like that. Webster Winery. <laughs> oh, God help if he was a film historian. Good thing he's a stunt coordinator because he's probably a tough, badass dude like Kane Otter. Probably kick our ass. Like, if we but he complains after every stunt. He's like, why did you have to make the airbag so hard? I know. He goes, oh, I know I just plowed through that brick wall and didn't get a thing and the wall got hurt more than me but i didn't like it <laughs> i love how we made this probably muscular guy that's like five yeah. times the size of us like into charles nelson riley you know why is the fire so yeah. hot why didn't you put me out sooner I know. oh i have to jump off 45 foot building again <laughs> <laughs> who is this guy I don't know. I'm gonna look him up, and I'm I'm kind of afraid because watch the one-off guy that of all things watch us or listen to us. It's gonna be this guy. He's probably gonna be this huge. He's like um, twice as big as Kane Otter. I know. Oh my god. Well, he looks. Uh, oh, so he looks a little older, and according to him, uh, to Kane Otter, he do- actually doesn't look so big. He Are you saying we like could take this. him? Could we take him? 
I don't know about taking him, but he's kind of like, um, he's definitely uh, more of like, it look, kind of looks like a 70s dude. He was a stunt double, though, uh, for a lot of movies that we know, though. So he was on Days of Our Lives, actually, for seven episodes. It's like a whole bunch of stuff, but he was an Australian thug, so I don't know about that. Mm. Um, he was in Remo Williams. Oh, that this was his acting. So he actually did some regular acting. Oh, my God, he was in So Fine. Do you remember that movie? As a boy, that what with the Richard Keel was in that one, and Ryan O'Neill. I just Jack want to know how old. Like, is this guy in his seventies that we could take him, or is he like? I, yeah, well, no, it looks. Yeah, he's got. He was acting for a while now, but um, I'm trying to think. I can't. Fortunately, IMDb did not give the year of his birth. Um, well, he started working in oh, eighty. Okay, he's sixty-eight years old. Okay, we can. So take him. I think we can probably. T- oh, actually, um, <laughs> he did. He died three weeks ago. <laughs> I, just, I don't mean that. <laughs> I can't. I am so sorry. This is not there. I don't mean to be d- disrespectful. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh at that. It's just like I'm literally lo- losing. Uh, I was just trying to read about him, and I and like I'm looking. I said, "Oh, okay, he's 60." And then I realized, no, he literally just died June 5th. Oh my gosh, this uh, is terrible. 2022. Oh my, but you know what? A great tribute to the man. Yes, <laughs> what a great and, tribute. We and, got a good laugh. Just so out you of know, him. it looks like his son um, is following in his footsteps because it's Webster Winery Jr. Well, we got to do a new generation of whining yes, stuntmen. He, he is, and we could take him because he's got a shoe size of eight. So <laughs> he's, he's only five foot five inches tall and 135 pounds. <laughs> Tim, you could easly take him like one handed. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my God. And he's a 30, 31 waist. Why is all these facts on him? On Oh, it's because I stunt. I, oh. oh, I guess that makes sense. I guess if you're trying to match him to uh, an actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can't have him like. Um, stunt double for Arnold Schwarzenegger or somebody, right? Yeah, no, no, he def- he's more like like the uh, like like uh, what's his face uh, on uh, like maybe the Stranger Things kids or something. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, like, the- get like that, like Finn Wolfhard, he might be uh, <laughs> look out for. Like, but, uh, oh my god, we've told. Do you realize in the last like five minutes we've totally disgraced and humiliated this poor. St- like legendary stunt family. It's like this forty-year-old stunt man that stunt doubles for teenage kids. I, yeah, well, he's a, yeah. I think he's only thirty-five, but yeah, you're oh, right. Oh my it's god! Like, yeah, we've just like, well, you mean you know that's how they do it. Like sometimes you know it's a you know it, like think about it. If you're that if you're if you don't have the physique, but you're willing to throw yourself off buildings or or, or light yourself on fire. I mean, it's good he can make a living out of it. So, you know, who cares if it's Stranger Things, man? That's a big show. I don't know what he's in there. I actually should look up see. I, I swear to God, if he actually did a stunt for Stranger Things, that's it. We, we got to end the podcast. Um, wait, I'm gonna look We're going to look Lipster, it up. Henry, <laughs> Junior. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh. He did um, – so the last thing he did was uh, – oh, no, he was an actor. Um, he oh was in God. iCarly. <laughs> Oh my God! He was in Return to Sleepaway Camp, a zipline boy. Um, okay, so the last, so the okay, so here's his stunts that he did. He was in uh, the Matrix Resurrections, okay, Quiet Place uh, Part Two, okay, uh, Bad Boys for Life, Bumblebee. So, oh, he's in a couple of the Transformer things. So, um, yeah, okay, so he, he's been, wow, he's got actually a lot of stuff. Did Iron Man three, Dark Knight Rises? They're called utility stunts. I'm not sure what that is. Hmm. Okay, and then somehow now I explain this one. He was a stunt double in the movie Hop, which was animated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and he was a stunt double for iCarly. Was Miranda Cosgrove thrown or something? How the heck are you a stunt double for an animated show? How are you stunt double for anime? Like they drop an anvil on your head and see how to draw it. Yeah, you know, I don't. Like, yeah, I really. Here, run off this cliff and like stay in the air for ten seconds while we draw it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, a poor Webster oh, Winery. Uh, the Winery family. I, I'd like to apologize <laughs> uh, because we did not mean to to mock you in any way. Oh, but it's it, just, I have not laughed that hard on the podcast in so long. Oh I know. I'm I like literally so crying literally right like, now. I mean, think about it. He just died like three weeks ago. I mean, not even like. Like they, 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 pro- they barely probably had his funeral already, and I, we, they, we had to bring him up. We're talking oh about God. beating the guy. 
I, I'm like, well, Tim, I, I could break it to you, but you not. I, I can almost guarantee you 100 percent you'd take them right now. Um, oh god, we're going oh, to hell. Cr- we're so going to hell. We're this, going to hell. Episode. I'm crying. Oh that my god, I'm it. crying. Yeah. I've literally got oh, tears god. streaming down my face. Okay, yeah. <laughs> let's recap this so we can move on. I uh, Michael Gingold. Okay. <laughs> July. The recap July 19th. We have uh, The Righteous from 2021. God Told Me To from 1976. The Aztec Mummy Collection, 57 to 64. <laughs> the Necrophiles from 97. Zombie Island Massacre Zombie. from 1984. And our pick of the week, starring God Rest His Soul, Rest in Peace, yes. The Great Webster <laughs> Winery. <laughs> Stunt man to the to the stars, uh, yes. And now in the stars somewhere, looking down upon looking this down little and podcast. Cursing us. <laughs> yeah, we have Aaron. somehow sending subliminal messages to his son, <laughs> West Webster Winery Junior, saying, "I need you to take care of some two podcasters for me." Will you? <laughs> Um, oh my god well at least he's pick of the week he's his pick, pick of the, of the week. week hell high so he's he's in there he's ingrained forever but i'll tell you i feel like we owe it to him we need to now buy this disc oh my gosh we're gonna have to um yeah arrow hell we high can do. hell high 1989 tons of extras in and an exclusive interview with, with poor webster the late great webster yes. winery all right so <laughs> moving on to july 26 geez <laughs> all right so this is a big week 10 releases this week and uh, we have a couple of reissues. We have The Guest from 2014 and Ouija, Origin of Evil, which is a... Uh, I like that one. I like that Ouija movie. Uh, that was yeah, the that, second was that the, that was the first one, right? No, the second one. Oh, that was the second one. Yeah. Yes, you're right. I, I did like the second one yeah, better. Yeah, that one was good. So first up, we have one that's uh, actually very close to my watch list because I'm going through that uh, Dario Argento project. And this is from Synapse Films. It's Tenebrae 4K from 1982, a classic and, uh, this, and one, this one came right after Nina Bray, right? No, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love this one. Yeah, this one was a fun one. I, I think I watched this during uh, for one of the horror challenges. Yeah, I've, I've seen this one a couple times. Uh, a razor-wielding psycho stalks a U.S. horror writer in Italy, which is essentially the plot of all of Dario Argento's <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, like, but, it really? Does, it's like, what's the difference with this yeah, one? No, it's, it's pretty much the same plot every time, but it, yeah. they're still fun. Uh, this one has a... Uh, New 4K restoration from the original camera negative. Oh, and you might be asking yourself, why is this not pick of the week? Let me tell you. I I selected six titles in this week out of ten that could have been pick of the week. Yeah, six out of same ten. With you. And when you hear, like, yeah, Tim's is, a, when you hear Tim's, you will you will completely understand why if you've been listening to this podcast. Right. And mine, you'll know what kind of I look for in pick of the weeks anyway, and you'll know why it's, yeah. I picked mine. But this one, on any other week, could have probably Easily, been. easily. Yeah, I mean, this one, this week is packed full of great pick of the weeks. Um, but anyway, this one, we had to pick, we only had to pick two. So, um, yeah, new 4K restoration from the original camera negative, limited edition packaging with reversible sleeve featuring original and newly commissioned artwork, but obviously creative. Illustrated collector's book, but featuring writing on the film by filmmaker Peter Strickland and Argento biographer Alan Jones. An interview with cinematographer Luciano Tavoli and a new in-depth analysis of the film by critic Ashley Lane. Fold-out double-sided poster featuring original and newly commissioned artwork by obviously creative. Six double-sided postcard-sized lobby card reproduction art cards. Uh, disc one, which is the 4K original version has the original Italian and English front and end titles and insert shots. Audio commentary by authors and critics Alan Jones and Kim Newman. Now, Kim Newman's grandfathered in. He got grandfathered in because he's been around for a while. But Alan oh, Jones no. is, is uh, kind of new. Um, yeah, Alan Jones is interesting. So he's heir to the Jones Soda Company. Actually, I don't know if you've had that, though. He became a, a, a film critic accidentally, actually, because... People just loved using his beverage descriptors in film as well, which is like – like he used to say, that film, that performance was very bubbly and effervescent and crisp. And so then they said, you know what? You just described uh, the film I just worked on. And then he thought he had a talent, so he became a film historian. Very nice. Very That's a very wholesome film historian. Yeah, yeah. But much happier ending than our, our, our Webster Winery. Uh, then our next uh, film – well, this is actually an expert. I should say audio commentary by Argento expert Thomas Rostock. Yeah, I, I put him on because he was a film historian at one point, and being an Argento expert kind of was like that's almost like that kind of kind of ups you in the film historian level without yeah. actually being named a film historian. Uh, but he's known around his biz for his little gifts around Christmas time. He playfully known as Rock Stocking Stuffers. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So next up, we have an audio commentary by. Maitland McDonough, author of Broken Mirrors, Broken Minds, and Dark Dreams of Dario Argento. 
Yellow Fever, The Rise and Fall of the Giallo, a feature-length documentary charting the genre from its beginnings to its influence on the modern slasher film, featuring interviews with Dario Argento, Umberto Lindsay, Luigi Cozzi, and more. I feel like those three people have been mentioned in the film historian, uh, f- f- uh, the dismemberments, more than any three people. Probably. Uh, I feel like once a week we're mentioning them. <laughs> uh, being the Villain, a newly edited archival interview with actor John Steiner. Out of the Shadows, an archival interview with Maitland McDonough. Voices of the Unsane, an archival feature containing interviews with writer-director Dario Argento, actresses Daria Nicolodi and Eva Robbins, cinematographer Luciano Tavoli, composer Claudio Simonetti, and assistant director Lamberto Bava. Screaming Queen, an archival interview with Daria Nicolodi. The Unsane World of Tenebrae, an archival interview with Dario Argento. A Composition for Carnage, an archival interview with Claudio Simonetti. Archival Introduction by Daria Nicolodi, international theatrical trailer, Japanese shadow theatrical trailer, alternate opening credit sequence, unsane end credit sequence, and image galleries. Then this too is the unsane version. It's a 4K limited edition exclusive. It's a re-edited 90-minute U.S. version, specially created for this release, uh, which is the uh, original is a 101-minute version, exclusive to 4K Blu-ray. It's got so what is this? I guess like I, I assume based on the way they call it, and they're cutting 11 minutes from it. I yeah. guess um, I, I assume it's like a much faster paced cut. Yeah, this, and this kind of sheds a little bit more light on it. There's two audio options, a recreation of the original theatrical experience complete with jump cuts and sudden audio shifts and a new, more seamless edit created for this release, both in restored lossless English monos. It sounds like they tried mm. to like kind of maybe streamline it and make it less jumpy. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Basically, ru- somewhat ruining it somewhat because ruining, that's like its yeah. charm. Exactly. I mean, you know, is those... It's like a giallo kind of like thing. I feel like those those crazy jump cuts and zooms and those like and sound the, 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 Yeah, the of... scores that make no sense. Oh, by yeah. the way, I forgot to tell you. Let me. I'll tell you after this. Um, original Take Me Tonight stereo EP recording performed by Kim Wilde and a disc three Blu-ray original version, which is all the same kind of as disc one. It's just the uh, the very original version. I forgot to tell you that, that um, I ordered. I found this record because I'm collecting vinyl records now. I found one that is a compilation of Italian horror film scores. Oh, wow. How cool is that? I mean, those are yeah. all usually great. This is like some of the great Italian horror film scores. When I get it in, I'm supposed to get it in next week. I will definitely like share it on Instagram and kind of tell you guys about it. You know, I, I always, I think we kind of like, I know we always say we want to like advance stuff to so like YouTube and stuff, but I think like that's like something to me that would be a good series on TikTok. You know, like you should do like when we get these horror finds, like maybe do a sh- brief video and put it on TikTok. Yeah, I did one video of a Blu-ray, um, which yeah, was that. that was it. That's, all, that's all I did. But I'm thinking I'm actually, I was going to get with Anna because she knows all this stuff. She's younger than me. She knows how to do yeah, all this. And get her to yeah, help me produce them. Yeah, I could, well, I could teach you. I, I get, I get Anna to teach me. And I thought maybe she could either edit my videos for YouTube or we could just do TikToks and I could do some like record reviews because I just got a copy of the Fury score uh, that John Williams oh. did. And it was it was amazing. It was really good. Like I enjoyed listening to it. It was very, very interesting. And I don't think it's something I mean, I got it for seven bucks at the record store. I mean, that's yeah. something that people wouldn't think to pick up, you know. And I told you, I think I mentioned this show before too, but just for any new listeners, maybe that I've heard, like when I, I remember I took a class when I went to, uh, uh, to San Francisco state and it was called rock since the sixties, but it was so cool. The classroom we had was like, a, it looked like a regular kind of classroom, but down below where the teacher had this desk, <clears throat> he'd open up the lid and it was an actually a record player in there. So all the music he would like give us example of and teach us, teach us about, he'd play on vinyl. And there's just something so like warm and like comforting about a vinyl record, you know, because those little imperf like imperfections, like a like a like a little fuzziness or a little like skip sometimes not like a skip that ruins the music, but yeah. you know, just like a little like off. For some reason, to me, that's so really now you get like near perfect like audio, and it's great. But at the same time, it's like when you grew up, like uh, we did with records, there's something kind of like almost like missing because in it, it because it's so perfect, you know. Like I kind of like the little imperfections of it, like like when you watch an old film and you see little like pixels and poxels going around, you know. And even with the newer, like the newer records, don't have any of that. You know, you don't hear yeah. that. Yeah. But I think the thing I like about them, and I heard a vinyl guy I watch on YouTube talking about this was. Um, especially in today's kind of fast paced world where you can just get anything on demand, you can't really skip, it's hard to skip around on a vinyl record. You really have to listen to it as an album. And that's an art form that you don't get, you know, rarely do people listen to albums anymore or listen to a complete side. 
Yeah, and it's like it, like even with and cassette tapes, it's the same same you know kind of similar thing. Like yeah, without like you were had to listen to it. I mean yes, you could pick it up and put it on your favorite song, but like you you have that excruciating like thing of squinting to make sure you get it right on the line. Mm-hmm. But um, but you know at the same time like there was no shuffle back then. There was no like oh I'm gonna you know you if you wanted just a one song you have to buy the forty five, which sometimes had benefits its own because sometimes on that B side you'd get um a song that was never released anywhere else, you know? And, like, I remember they tried it briefly in, like, the later with the singles. Remember that? Oh, yeah, those were, yes. Like, a couple of things I remember those, But, you know, now now with everything digital and on CD, you can do the shuffle, and it's not the same thing. It's, you know, it's like now you you don't get the story that the album... Because back then, like, you know, there was a, uh, a specific order. Like, if you watch any music documentary about creating an album... They go into why they created, why they put this song where it was, especially like someone like a like a Pink Floyd or oh, something yeah. like that. Oh yeah, that was very. I mean, you know, I know we're kind of veering into like a music podcast, but but you know, this is one of our interests. And you know, it's the same thing. It's like crafting a film. Well, musicians would craft an album, and they'd want you to hear it in a certain order, and that is now lost. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes they'll if it's if an artist these days really wants you to do that, they'll kind of like almost have to advertise it. Like say, hey, by the way, listen to this in this order, or you know, like here's the, this is the way I want you to listen. Or they could do that like trick that some of them did, where there was no chapter stops, kind of a thing, you know. Yeah. Like um, David Lynch did that with um on a on a Blu-ray uh f- I think it was uh, Mulholland uh, Drive where there were no chapter stops on the Blu-ray because he wanted you to watch the movie in its entirety, probably because 90% of the people had forwarded to the uh, Naomi Watts, uh, Laura Howard, exactly, uh, yeah. lesbian scene. But uh, <laughs> cause I guarantee you that's, you know, because that was, I remember when that movie came out, that was like all over the internet. People kept posting that. And I'm like, and meanwhile, then you miss like this, another David Lynch masterpiece of a film. Cause you see that film out of co- that scene and you watch that, you have no idea what the movie is and you see it out of context and it makes no sense. And it's a confusing movie to begin with. To try, like any David Lynch the film is. So it's like, yeah, so I, like, that. you're right. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a huge thing with, you know, that you that is lost now in the art of music. Like anything, like technology co- always comes at a price. Yeah. Yes, you'll have it instantaneous. You'll have it in the way you want it, but not the way it was intended. And that's, there's a, there's a fine line between that. You know, in vinyl records, obviously you can get, you can get some records cheap, you know, the, in the used bin or whatever, but... A brand new pressing of a vinyl record is anywhere from twenty five to thirty bucks. I mean, they're not cheap, mm. and it's taught me to really appreciate an album in a way that you don't appreciate when you can just get it for free on Amazon or Spotify and just click on it and start playing it. When you have a thirty dollar disc in your hand that you've made an agonizing choice to spend that much money for this particular album, I mean, it's. It's a whole new level of appreciation of that music. Yeah, and I, like I still have, yeah, I still have a whole box of Kiss albums still there. So yeah, I mean, it's it just it's a it's a different level of appreciation, and I I have dabbled in it for a little while ever since I got our record player, but only recently, I think this year for some reason, I guess because I just finally got settled in the new house and every, every had things like I wanted it and had the sound system hooked up and everything. I've really understand now why people get hooked on collecting vinyl because it is such a, uh, it, it's fun. And I love getting used albums that I've never heard before, like that Fury soundtrack. And then you like, it's a big surprise and you just absolutely loved it and discovering new music that way. But then on the other hand, I also like that what I was talking about, how it makes you appreciate albums and stuff more so anyway well yeah i mean you know and it looks like 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 the same thing with the physical media while i still collect blu-rays you know because we like the cover art well album art was like a big thing in itself i mean there was a and you know and when you think about it it's like a big piece of art because it's not like it's tiny like a cd oh yeah it's huge the same matches the same art but it's not the same you see it on a cd like a little square versus like a big like cardboard square that you pull out you know and remember it's like you know no one really had the space ever to 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 display it like face front so it would be interesting you just see the spine and you'd pull it out and you'd get this amazing like piece of art yeah they like i've got one that's um well like a perfect example there's i've got a copy of harvest moon which is a new pressing of harvest moon neil young which is just a plain album cover it's a yellow album cover that says harvest moon on it but that big 
you know, when you see it that big in your hands, it's beautiful. I mean, it just looks beautiful. Yeah. And you open it up and there's pictures. I mean, it just, it's, it's a whole new level of appreciation for, for music. And I think that's why so many artists are really keen these days on releasing their stuff on vinyl too, because it gives them a chance to put all that artwork there where people can appreciate it and see it in a way they don't get when they're just clicking through these streaming sites, which right. I don't know. I, I may sound like an old fuddy duddy, but I think no, I'm know, with you. vinyl's getting really popular. And it's not just old guys. It's you know, a lot of young people are flocking to vinyl now uh, because of those very same reasons. Yeah. Well, did you see, um, you know, uh, Hellbender, of course, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, the Toby and, and Zelda and, and um, John are doing, they're doing a, um, they're releasing the Hellbender on a uh, soundtrack on vinyl. Yeah, I, I think they mentioned it on Joe Bob, but I also saw them post about it. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna order. I definitely gonna order that because I wanna like that'd be a cool thing. I mean, not that I have many like. I mean, I have a box of older albums, and then I have a box of ones that I was collecting. I used to collect movie soundtracks on albums. I got some really cool ones mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah, I'm getting into that for sure. Yeah, so I mean, I have some good ones there, and so I want to get like I remember one of the one of the ones when I was a kid. One of my favorite ones was the Close Encounters. I had soundtrack mm -hmm. on on album. Um, I know my dad has got a box of old records somewhere too that he had some really cool uh, things like that, and all my Kiss albums I got to dig up somewhere, which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, maybe we'll do like a little weird like offshoot series of like vinyl. I'll go get because I know where the box is. It's in storage right now. I should dig it out. I mean, I'm gonna go through that anyway, try and go through storage and minimize and stuff. But that's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah. But maybe I'll just pull that box out and we can go through it one time. Well, I'm, I'm definitely gonna do some on on the, my horror albums because they, there's some really cool stuff out there released on for horror scores i mean i'm talking about you go in my record store i've got a brand new pressing of children of the corn i've got brand new pressing day of the dead i've got um not, this is not stuff i personally own it's stuff i've seen in the record store i've seen like scream there's a scream vinyl box set of all the scream scores oh, wow there's uh halloween kills just came out on score and it's just evil dies tonight for two hours no i'm just kidding it's, it's actual score yeah. but yeah it's it's um it the even horror scores on vinyl is a big business i mean there's a company uh that i can't remember the name of right now i'm sorry but they they do nothing but horror scores on vinyl um, so yeah, it's, it's huge. I know we went on a big tangent, but well, that's something I'm excited about. Well, I, yeah, you should check out Mondo shop, Tim, mm -hmm. cause that does, uh, that basically does, um, they have a lot of different things, but, um, I, they do, it's, it's, if the Mondo shop is actually the record uh, company only. So they have a ton of new stuff like that. They come out of vinyl. Like they, they literally have like Jurassic park, Domin Jurassic world dominion on there and Suspiria, the soundtrack. On oh, LP. um, I know the other one, Waxwork is another one that does horror scores. Yes, yes, because I, I always get their equal. They even have a Rogue One uh, uh, version of that. Uh, they have that, and they also have Lost in Concert on um, on uh, uh, vinyl. And it's actually done by Michael Giacchino, which Tim is a theme park fan. You should know he was the one that redid uh, Space Mountain theme in, um, for Disneyland, the new uh, oh, yeah, music yeah. there. So, yeah, I mean, there's yeah, some so cool there's stuff on here. a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, so check out Mondo Shop. Uh, Waxworks just has just released Mad God score on vinyl. Oh, and we just did, did you like... see that got the number one Shutter debut in history or something like that? Really? That's or no, no, it's 2022. Sorry, the biggest uh, so far, uh, biggest release of, uh, of a debut in. Uh... That's cool. Yeah, so that's good for them. All right. Well, anyway, that was our long. Uh... Yeah, sorry, we went way off. Yeah, topic. but yeah. Uh, I think the next one up is yours, Brian. After you skip my pick of the week. Yes, and that is Species 4K. Uh, of course, uh, for 1995, everyone knows this movie. This was a uh, this was like a really cool like this was a, like kind of like another rebirth of good sci-fi horror. Um, I remember that. Uh, so it's when a beautiful human alien hybrid escapes from observation. Scientist Xavier Fitch dispatches a crew of experts to find her before she is able to fulfill her horrific purpose to mate with an unsuspecting man and produce offspring that could destroy mankind. As her deadly biological clock ticks rapidly, Fitch and the team are hurled into a desperate battle with the fate of humanity itself in uh that hangs in the balance of course this was nastasia hentridge uh was brought onto the world in this film um and tim wrote loved this one for obvious reasons um <laughs> i was i mean yeah, i was, was a favorite one i was a young strapping lad oh I, come on who, yeah yeah who didn't want to see yeah. natasha hentridge naked no yeah no i saw this in the theater actually this yeah. was uh and i love this one and 
by the way, do you know another uh, very famous uh, actress that got uh, got that was one of her earliest things? No. Do you remember Tim? Uh, I don't remember. Give you a little on uh, on uh, the spot trivia here. I don't know. I haven't seen this movie in so long. Well, the one that played the young version of Nastasha Hentridge in this was none other than Michelle Williams. Oh, really? Interesting. I mean, she had been in stuff before. Right, yeah. Uh, like some like TV shows and some TV movies, but that was like her first big movie, technically, and she was only in it for a little bit. But um, I did yeah, not know so that. She was, yeah, she played the young uh, Silly, like, Silly, or I forgot her name, yeah. or something like that. Um, but anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, so this is got this is a, a definitely a, kind of a, like a modern day classic. Uh, Disc one is a 4K Blu-ray, and UK 4K restoration of the film from the ultra uh, for the original camera negative audio commentary with Stasha Hentridge, Michael Madsen, and director Roger Donaldson. Then it's got another audio commentary with director Roger Donaldson, makeup effects uh, creator Steve Johnson, visual effects supervisor Richard Edland, and producer Frank Mancuso Jr., of course, from Friday the 13th fame. And you know what's actually cool about that, that they split the commentary. With the director has one with the with the actors and then one with, like, the, the crew, you know? it's kind Yeah, of like I like a, when they do definitely that. Definitely different yeah. vibe than if you put them all together because you're going to kind of discuss different well, yeah, things. Yeah, you, you, know? you could do one technical commentary with the special effects right. people and one more kind of the on set experience with the others. I, I like when they do that. I think it's cool. Right. right. Oh, it's Syl. That was her name. Syl, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, and anyway, uh, so disc three uh, as a Blu-ray. It's Afterbirth, The Evolution of Species, featuring interviews with Roger uh, Donaldson, cinematographer, and Anz J... Oh, God. Anz <laughs> J. Bartwiak. Or Bartowiak. I don't know. Bartowiak. I don't know. Uh, production designer, John Muto. Composer, Christopher Young. Creature designer, Steve Johnson. And more... From Sill to Eve, an interview with uh, with actress Nastasha Hentridge. Engineering Life, H.R. Geiger at Work, The Making of Species, The Origin, The Concept of Discovery, Designing a Hybrid, Theatrical Trailer, Alternate Ending, and Photo Galleries, which have production design, creature design, film stills, behind-the-scenes photos, and poster and lobby cards. That's a good, nice packed disc. Yeah, that's a, that's a great... Again, like I said, these any of these could be pick of the week for sure. Um, yeah. The next one up is from Kino Lorber. This one is actually a really cool movie. I watched this one, I believe, I want to say for a horror challenge because I'd heard some trivia about it. Um, mainly because it influenced Alien significantly and also influenced the costumes in X Men, uh, in the X Men movies. Um, this is from Kino Lorber, Planet of the Vampires, 1965. In the near future, the two spaceships Argos and Galliot are sent to investigate the mysterious planet Aura. As the Galliot lands on the planet, her crew suddenly go berserk and attack each other. The strange event passes, but the crew soon discovers the crashed Argos and learns that her crew died fighting each other. Investigating further, the explorers come to realize the existence of a race of bodiless aliens that seek to escape from their dying world. Definitely go watch this one. It's really, really good. It's super influential uh, on on future movies, and uh, not enough people probably... Uh, have heard of this one because you always hear about Forbidden Planet and some of those that are a little more yeah, yeah. well known. But this one was great when I watched it; I really enjoyed it. Uh, this has a new 2K restoration of the film, new audio commentary by critics Kim Newman, his grandfather Ian, and Barry Forshaw. Yes, well, we 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 can, of course we know them; uh, they're they're neighbors. Um, and but Kim Newman is a uh, is uh, he's a terrible neighbor to him though, and of course. Um, Barry, whenever he sees him, he says, hello, Newman. <laughs> but uh, I did discover something new about, uh, there's an update on Barry Forshaw. Oh, wow, really? Apparently, he just he started hosting a new review show, and where his, when he signs off and he loves a movie, he says, go see it, Forshaw. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. Well, so next up is our audio commentary by Mario Bava biographer, which I did not know this was in his repertoire, Tim yeah. Lucas. And Tim Lucas is our southern gentleman uh, redneck Joe Bob. Which goes off. perfectly with Mario Bava. Yeah, you know? perfectly. All right. Uh, has alternate music score highlights, original Italian opening credits, trailers from hell with Joe Dante, trailers from hell with Josh Olsen, natural trailer, limited edition Oak Art slipcase, and reversible art. Another good disc. And the next one is by Kino Lorber. They're back again. Uh, they're dominating this. Uh, oh, this, July. This they're just killing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they saved all their releases for this this uh, this month. Is I'm Dangerous Tonight from 1990. It says, When Amy turns an ancient Aztec priest cloak into a dress, she discovers it's cursed, and whoever wears it comes under its evil influence. So it's another killer dress movie, essentially. <laughs> um, it says, not, uh, not, uh, Ant- uh, bleh. Uh, Tim is not sure what's going on, but he's got, but it's got Anthony Perkins, which is good, but it's got Match and a Mick, so I'm automatically in. Yeah. 
uh, right there. Big fan of hers from Twin Peaks and from uh, all her other movies. And uh, I think she, what, she was on Riverdale, right, recently? I think so, yeah. Um, new 2K restoration of the film. Uh, it's got a new audio commentary with Christopher Woofter <laughs> and Will Dotson, editors of American Twilight, the cinema of Toby Hooper. Then uh, we got a new audio commentary by filmmaker historian Michael Verratti. That's a new one, Tim. Mm. Um, and he, by the way, Tim, he's very legendary. He's not only the, a filmmaker historian, but he's also the first film historian and exercise instructor. Oh, wow. Because he owns uh, Verratti's Pilates, <laughs> uh, where during each pose, he calmly delivers a fun film fact. Like, you know, he goes, he'd be like, okay, Lotus and rest. Imagine a mix starred in my film, <laughs> I'm Dangerous Tonight from 1990. That sounds fun. I would do that one. It does, right? Yeah. I would do that. Yeah. I would definitely do it. Um, Devil in a Red Dress interview with actress D. Wallace. Oh, got to love D. Love Wallace. Love D. Wallace. She's a You know what? I, I, was, I was angry at my friend Dom. It was in a thing. We were t- Somehow there was a something about, oh, because the Who's the Boss sequel got announced. Did you see that Cone was telling us about yeah. that? Did you see that? Yeah. And uh, so then it got into this discussion of like uh, who was – like he wouldn't – our friend Dom didn't want to see it unless Judith Light comes back. But then we discussed if Danny Pintaro was coming back. And then that got to the point of where he got, he thought in real life that he got eaten or got chased by a rabid dog, forgetting it was Cujo. <laughs> and then he made the egregious error, that an unforgivable error, by saying that he didn't remember if it was D. Wallace or Melinda Dillon. Oh, my gosh. No. And I said, hey, shame on you, Dom. It's, of course, Mel- uh, <laughs> Melinda. Of course, it's D. Wallace. How dare you? And then we went on a whole Mel- Melinda Dillon repertoire from Christmas Story and Slap Shots. And, oh, my gosh. Uh, anyway. But, yeah. But how, how – I mean, I do see why back in the – you know, they were they – were, had a similar look about them back then. But, I mean, any horror fan, how dare you not know D. Wallace? Um, she was queen of all the eighties moms. Queen. And still is. Still She's is. still a queen yeah. in my opinion. And I like and I remember she is like in 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 person, she is actually even more wonderful than the farthest reaches of your brain can imagine. And, uh, you know, she's uh, she'll give you a nice hug, she'll pose a picture, she'll chat with you. She's got always got that big giant smile of hers on there. She's you awesome. know, so yeah. She is the best. Uh seeing red, interview with director of photography Levi Isaacs. Uh, making I'm Dangerous Tonight, behind-the-scenes footage with optional commentary with videographer Stan Giesa, moderated by filmmaker Michael Felsher. Addressed to bring out the devil in you, a new video essay by filmmaker and programmer Chris O'Neill. Oh, he's back again. <laughs> uh, original video trailer. All right, next up we have another in the Giallo Essentials series. This is from Arrow, and this is Giallo Essentials Black. We've done red and yellow so far, I believe. I'm just waiting for the whole color spectrum in one box. I can't deal with these little mini boxes. I know. Uh, this is 1972 to 1974 and includes three films, Smile Before Death, The Weapon, The Hour, The Motive, and The Killer Reserve Nine Seats. I love their names. Uh, brand yeah. new 2K restorations from the original camera negatives of Smile Before Death and The Weapon, The Hour, The Motive. 2K restoration from the original camera negative of The Killer Reserve Nine Seats. Rigid box packaging with original poster artwork and a windowed Jello Essentials collection slipcover. Reversible sleeves for each film featuring original and newly commissioned artwork by Adam Rabelais, Peter Strain, and Haunt Love. Disc one, this is Smile Before Death. Brand new audio commentary by actors, I'm sorry, actors, authors and critics, Troy Howarth and Nathaniel Thompson. Of course, they turn into Statler and Waldorf. Yeah, they 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 needed Bruce, though, to be the full stitching. <laughs> yes. Uh, original Italian and English front and end titles. Smile of the Hyena, a brand new video interview with Stefano Amadio, film journalist and son of director Silvio Amadio. Never before seen extended nude scenes not used in the final film and an image gallery. Well, there's the purchase uh, reason right there. There you go, right there. (laughs) This too is The Weapon, The Hour, The Motive. Brand new audio commentary by author and critic Alexandra Heller Nicholas, who is our saucy little minx. Yes. And did you say she really was? You saw her in a... Uh, like you saw her do a commentary and you said we got pretty close on that one. I can't remember if I thought she, it was pretty close or exact opposite. I can't remember at the time. We'll have to go look I her I thought up. it was pretty close, but I don't know. I could be wrong. I can't, I'm trying to remember. You know, it's so rare we actually confirm these film historian looks. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. A Man in Giallo, a brand new video interview with actor Salvatore Pontillo. Front and end titles for the Lost English Language dub and image gallery. And then our final disc, The Killer Reserve Nine Seats. Brand new audio commentary by author and critic Kat Ellinger, which she's great. I've, I've seen her on a number of uh, 
commentaries and stuff now. I really like her. And she's grandfathered in because she's uh, she's old school. Hanging with Howard, a video interview with actor Howard Ross. Writing with Biagio, a video interview with screenwriter Biagio Proietti. Italian theatrical trailer in Italian and English. Image gallery. And first pressing only, individual illustrated collector's booklets for each film featuring new writing by Rachel Nisbet, Barry Forshaw, and Peter Jumstad. I like saying Nisbet like that for some reason. Nisbet. Well, I always think of, um, once again, I'm going to go to an obscure uh, thing in, um, from uh, Dudley Moore's classic, Arthur. Uh, that movie when uh, like Liza Minnelli gets a ride home, remember? And she goes, oh, this Mrs. Nesbitt. Um, <laughs> like, like she goes, I got to see her coming out of this. And then so she, she goes to get out. And then like, you know, Ted Ross, who plays uh, you know, Bitterman, he goes, he goes, stay, let me allow the door. Mrs. Nesbitt deserves the full treatment. You know, and he says it sarcastically. So. <laughs> I love Arthur, by uh, the way. I, that that's a movie I can watch literally over and over and over again and never get bored. Um, anyway, uh, next one is Lionsgate uh, releases Mid Century uh, for 2022. It says a husband and wife's weekend in a mid century modern vacation rental turns deadly when the husband discovers the owner is a psychopath with a backyard of buried secrets and designs on his wife. And there is no features. <laughs> but this one, you know, this one has Stephen Lang. I would the only the only reason I would watch this is for Stephen Lang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, very few other reasons yes, to watch. Yeah, it doesn't look very good otherwise. Okay. Uh, Vinegar Syndrome's next up with Scared to Death from 1980. An ex-cop now working as a hack novelist is called out of retirement to help investigate a string of deaths that appear to be the work of a serial killer but sooner revealed to be the work of the Syngenor, the synthesized genetic organism. Uh, this one looks kind of cheesy, monster flickish, but it looks, you know, those are always fun to watch, so I'll probably give it a shot. No extras on that yeah. one either, though, which is kind of interesting for a vinegar syndrome disc. Yeah, usually they have a couple of things. On but there again, you know, these these are a month out, so because it's the last week of July, so sometimes you know they'll add stuff at the last minute that wasn't on the press release. So, yeah, check it out. Uh, next one is Altered Innocence, which is a definitely a first. I think we've ever mentioned, but I, somehow I guess they're collected the Mambo Macabro. As uh, the the only feature on there on this thing is a trailer for Altered Innocence and Mondo Macabro, so they must have some kind of like partnership. But uh, anyway, so uh, this one is called Apocalypse After, and it's from 2018. Um, so I guess this is a un like a, a like kind of like an unauthorized sequel to Apocalypse Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it says an abandoned seaside resort. The shooting for a fantasy film about the end of an era wraps up. Two women, both members of the film crew. One an actress, the other a director. Apocalypse and Joy are on the verge of concluding their love affair. So her name is one woman is named Apocalypse, and one name is Joy. Yeah, I, I guess. guess. I mean, usually you would name your kids Pride and Joy, but yeah, but... or, or Almond. <laughs> Apocalypse is a really yeah. Yeah. Apocalypse is a really. What do you bad call thing. it for short? Like, hey, Pocky. Apo. I don't know. Yeah. Apo. Yeah. Lipsy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, well, if it was well, that's the thing. If it was um, it was some of a, a Kim and Kat uh, nemesis, it would be they they call themselves uh lips. Yeah. Because remember they didn't they, like the 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 Kim friend that yes. just went by his last name, which is how Icarus Age was born. Yes. But. Uh, that brings us to our picks of the week. And Brian, I'll tell you, I did not put all the extras for this one on here because if I did, we would have been here another hour. I was going to say, this seems surprisingly small for what I can imagine. Well, they had listed every audio commentary separately for every episode. So you can imagine it was like 23 audio commentaries. I just I couldn't there, do it. Were there film historians, though? There or? was, but they were all people we already knew. So I just, I was like, I'm going to just condense this. So um, this is a... My pick of the week, my pick of the month, Kino Lorber's Night Gallery Season 2, 1971-1972. I absolutely loved the Season 1 set, even though Season one's not a very good season of Night Gallery. They were just getting kind of going. It was very inconsistent. It was a very short season. Uh, did not have a lot of episodes. Uh, there were some real clunkers in there. Or a couple, I would say there's maybe two like really classic episodes in Season 1. But despite that, the commentaries and the extras were so good. Like I completely enjoyed every minute of it. And season two is actually a decent season of night gallery. So now you combine that with all the outstanding extras. And I cannot wait to get my hands on this disc. Uh, I do already have it pre-ordered. Um, this one is a new 2k restoration. It has lost tales from season two, die now, pay later, room for one less, Witch's feast and little girl lost. Audio commentaries for all episodes, and some of them have multiple audio commentaries. I know the first disc, I mean, the first season had like 
Some of them had two or three commentaries, which was outstanding. Uh, revisiting the gallery, a look back feature with actors Lindsay Wagner, Pat Boone, Joseph Campanella, Laurie Prang, James Metropole, directors John Badham, Janot Svork, William Hale, composer Gil Malay, makeup artist Leonard Engelman, artist Tom Wright, and Night Gallery authors, historians. Ooh, I missed that one. Night Gallery authors, historians Jim Benson and Scott Skelton. Remind me on that, and we'll, we'll mention it next week because I'll, I'll do some digging on them. Yeah, and I, I missed actually another one here. Oops. Uh, the Syndication Conundrum Part 2, a look at the show's troubled second life in reruns, a feature it by film historian Craig Beam. That's another one we missed. Oh, we have him. Oh, we do? Okay. Yes, at least we, ha- we have him. Um, I, I will go quickly pull up uh, from the uh, the the tome of 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 uh, Cody here. Yeah, so Craig Beam, remember he was no relation to Justin Beam, uh, which is another film historian. Uh, Craig was at the top of all his classes, an expert in his film historian duties. They often refer to him as the Beam of the Crop. <laughs> okay, good. We have a we actually have an index to like quickly reference these. Yes, thanks to Cody. Thank thank thankfully Cody, the wonderful person that she is and dear friend of ours, has done yes. for us. So. Uh, art gallery, the paintings feature of the artist Tom Wright. Nineteen TV spots, newly really remastered in HD. NBC TV promos from the 2008 DVD release and DVD Easter eggs. Fantastic set. I would highly recommend season one. I have no doubt season two is going to be even better. How many seasons are there? Five? Um, I think there's only three, I want to say. Yeah, because I think I'm I'm kind of holding out for like a box, a complete series. Because I have a complete series on DVD already i have the complete set but i want to like uh, this is one i'd want to upgrade eventually i want to upgrade my twilight zone too mm-hmm. um but uh yeah oh and before i go into my pick of the week i, I have a little fun fact to apocalypse after because <laughs> i'm like i gotta look up this thing because this sounds like such a i wanted to know if it was anything have anything to do with um you know like apocalypse now is like a kind of a reference or anything but it stars one of the stars is elena late Le- Le- I'm going to pronounce her name. I think it looks like Lowenstone, but I think it's Lavenstone because it's got the two dots over the O. Alina, uh, and she was actually known for two uh, big roles. Uh, one was Schindler's List. and But more importantly, she was the uh, gymnast in Seinfeld. Remember the one that goes, the the one that uh, like had her friend uh, Mishka, whatever, that was in the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was all upset that he that Jerry Seinfeld wasn't. Jerry was upset that he wasn't the apparatus because she was a gymnast. But I actually uh, was at a wedding where she was present because um, the Mark's sister uh, was friends with her. Uh, you know, uh, Adrian Shelley. So she was friends with her. So when I was at Adrian's wedding, um, she was there, and I saw her, and I recognized her. I like from Seinfeld. I'm like, is that you know? But I didn't go up to her or anything because I didn't want to be <laughs> like one of these obnoxious people. But uh, but yeah, so a little fun fact that somehow I'm somehow remotely connected to Apocalypse. <laughs> That's funny. Um. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, last final thing is my pick of the week, and that is the incredible strange films of Ray Dennis Steckler. And this is one Cone like, singled out for us, like, a month or two ago, I think. Because mm-hmm. this is one of those sets that just Tim, Tim and I want, regardless of, even though we have, I never heard of this guy. Well, I've got the, I've got the weird Wisconsin set. Right, so do I. The Bill, we yeah. both have that Bill Rebane one, and that the Bill Weird Wisconsin, and we, we're still kicking ourselves over the Al Adams debacle that we never got. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so this one is 20, it says this box set contains 20 incredibly strange films scanned in 4k or 2k from the best existing 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter vault elements, sole remaining prints and video masters, including several rarely seen thought lost or never before on disc, plus all new special features, audio commentaries, full color book, and more that smashes the fun barrier. Um, I know, Tim, you did not include everything on here, but... Oh, you did, actually, didn't you? Yes, it's got everything. I don't know if we want to go through everything, but... Or we just want to just say summaries of the... This is... uh, Yeah, this is really a lot. Uh, Maybe I'll just go through them. Let's let's just go through the titles. I mean, there... Just suffice it to say, there are, like, multiple commentaries, multiple extras for every one of these ten discs. So we're just going to give you the movies that are included. Yeah, okay, so the, the here's the discs. So it's a uh, first uh, one is Wild Guitar from 1962. Then there's uh, the Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. Then, uh, t- oh no, that's a trailer. Uh, the Thrill Killers from 1965. Rat F- Fink a Boo Boo <laughs> and the Lemon Grove Kids. <laughs> that's so 60s. Um, that's two different movies, yeah, from um, 
Oh, wait a minute. Why is it the Lemon Grove kids have two years? I have no idea. I just copied and pasted. Yeah, okay. So, anyway, it's 65 for the Boo Boo one and Lemon Grove's. Uh, it says 67 slash 69. I don't know what happened. Um, then there's uh, Body Fever from 1969 and Cynthia, spelled S I N, Thea. Uh, the Devil's Doll. So, a little play on Cynthia there. I like it. Then uh, they got uh, Blood Shack. Blood Shack, <laughs> baby. No. Uh, from 1971, uh, The Hollywood Stranger meets the Skid Row Slasher. That's the first epic team up of killers we never heard of uh for 1980 and then the las vegas serial killer from 1987 that that one sounds like my favorite disc and that one's got an introduction by joe bob briggs on it I'm, and an audio commentary by joe bob briggs i know we're gonna say it but you know when joe bob gets mentioned he gets yeah he gets, he gets mentioned. mentioned um he, he gets uh takes priority um then we got the mad life of a hot vampire uh nazi brothel <laughs> love life of hitler's nazis and count al come <laughs> But it's like AL dash come. Uh, that one obviously he was making a statement. Yes, I think a lot of these something. are getting into that territory. Yeah, um, yeah. Then he's got disc nine. Uh, we're already there. okay. Here's the best one: Doctor Cock Love <laughs> and the Sexorcist Devil and Red Here, spelled H E A R. Red Here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that one's all about. Uh, and then the final movies are Summer Fun. Re, 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 oh wait, sorry, Reading, Pennsylvania, and one more time from 2000. This guy's making movies in 2008. I know, it's crazy. Wow. Well, you know, I've heard of, I've heard of the incredibly strange creatures who start living and became mixed up zombies, and I've also heard of Rat Finka Boo Boo, so I've heard, at least yes, heard I, of some I've of I've seen these. that yeah. one before, yeah. So, I kind of, part of me wants to get them, I think this set is like $200. Does it come with like a mask or some weird kind of thing, I, like a head? Yeah, I don't know if the, it, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it, it's one of those that, I would love to have these giant boxes, but like you never know because it's like, I don't know. Do you take a chance on 25 movies that are probably all horrible, but the box set is so incredibly cool? Like, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I have to say, okay, so for the amount of content you get, one $150 is not horrible. No, 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 not at I all. I think right. some of the other ones were that price and you didn't get 20 movies. All right, guys, so let's recap the week of July 26th. And we had, if I can scroll back to the front of this, Tenebrae 4K from 1982, Species 4K, Collector's Edition from 1995, Planet of the Vampires, 1965, I'm Dangerous Tonight from 1990, Giallo Essentials Black from 72-74, Mid-Century from 2022, Scared to Death from 1980, Apocalypse After from 2018, My Pick of the Week, Night Gallery Season 2. This is the big season. It had like, Way more episodes. I think it had like 60 episodes compared to the other like 20 episode oh, seasons. Wow. So this was a huge set. It's also pricier. I think it's like 75 bucks, but well worth it. And then Brian's pick of the week is a crazy Severin box set of the incredibly strange films of Ray Dennis Steckler. 20 incredibly strange films. A ton of extras. 30 plus hours of extras. Definitely a really cool one to pick up to kind of go with your uh, weird Wisconsin and if you were lucky, your Al Adams set. So... <laughs> Um, Ugh, I'm so mad we don't have that out. I know. There. And it's like, the funny thing is like, if you try and find it like aftermarket, it's like just ridiculous. Oh, it's like trying to right. buy my Halloween set like from Shout Factory. Like you, that thing's like 300 bucks now. Yeah, the only thing, oh, it's Al Adams' son technically. We can't Al, Al Adams, but it's Al Adams' son. That's my fault. I keep saying it. But um, yeah, if we were, yeah, but I mean, sometimes, you know, they might re, re release that. All right, guys, so we will see you back here next month for our August release releases. 